really excited to be here. Um, so today, what I wanted to talk about is uh, what we learned, um, my company pegged software, building an R Python hybrid analytics pipeline. Um, but before I get into that, I just want to give you a little bit of context on what the company exactly does. Um, so our mission is to help healthcare organizations recruit better. And so what that means is we have a bunch of job applicants to a hospital or a clinic, and we try to figure out who the best fit for that job is. Um, and we do, we provide the service by linking up with their historical HR data, we have our own proprietary survey, and we join these different small complex data sets to build something useful for them. Um, so you can already guess that the data science team plays a really important role in, in delivering this service. And so I'd like to focus on kind of like the first point here, or one of the core activities, our core activities, is to build, evaluate, refine, and deploy predictive models. We also work with engineering and product management to um, you know, ingest and store data and do some other cool things. But uh, I really want to focus this talk on the first point in particular, the, uh, the first three, the building, evaluation, and refinement of predictive models. So if I were to distill sort of the central question uh, of what the data science team has to tackle sort of day to day and also to a longer time scope, it's this question. How might we build a predictive analytics pipeline that is reproducible, maintainable, and statistically rigorous? And I would say this as um, this is kind of a core question uh, of data science as a profession, I think, in general. Um, so to help us kind of tackle this question, I'd like to go through kind of a, a thinking framework that we use to kind of reason about those three points of reproducibility, maintain maintainability, and statistical rigor. Um, so we like to anchor ourselves to problem statements or use cases. Um, and so there are these six steps that you don't have to re necessarily follow linearly. But to give you a little bit of a concrete example, say I need ma a maintainable code base. So you know, the first thing that comes to mind is Git. It's great for version control and a bunch of other things. Um, but it's nice to kind of scope out the different solution, solutions to your problem. And whenever you make a decision, it's important, I think, to justify it with you know, some reasons. It could be as arbitrary or trivial as Git is popular and I know how to use it. Um, you don't necessarily have to document it, but we find that useful for some of our more um, complex questions. Uh, you implement the solution, and then you want to see whether it working in day to day kind of like solves your problem, and you rinse and repeat as, as it, this kind of endless iterative process. So this is a talk about an R Python pipeline. This is a little cartoon of what it kind of looks like. It's a sort of a classic formulation of how data might flow through a predictive pipeline. Um, one thing to note, and I'll return to this later, um, is we use Python for a lot of the control flow, data manipulation, uh, uh, read-write operations, things like that. And then we use R for a lot of the, the heavy lifting on the model build and evaluation stage. I, don't, I won't get too much into the deployment, um, so we'll kind of constrain our discussion to that. And so I'll give you a little bit of a sketch of our tech stack. And basically, these are, I've kind of formulated the problems of those three points, you know, uh, maintainability, reproducibility, and statistical rigor into these five needs that we have. And we need to fulfill them. And on sort of the right side, you can see the different choices we've made in terms of tools that we've chosen. Um, so I'll start with Git. I won't, you know, you, a lot of you might be already familiar with the virtues of version control and Git in particular. But for us, what it means is that because of we use Git and because we use, a, we use it to facilitate a code review process, it buys us these three things, which I think are really important um, uh, for, to answer those three questions that I, uh, three points that I asked in the beginning. Um, so it, we've, you know, you can see improvement in the code quality. It also acts as a, a, a kind of medium for incremental knowledge transfer. So other people in your team reading your code uh, kind of distributes the knowledge of the domain in your repository. 
Um, and it also finally acts as a nice sanity check. So you know, you like you have a function and it does what it says it's, it does in the docs. All right, so next we want to be able to sync package dependencies. And um, for anyone who's done a lot of sort of collaborative work, this is really important when you want a reproducible pipeline. You want to know, you want to make sure that um, the packages you're using and the versions you're using and the dependence between the packages are all sorted out. Um, and so for the Python end, we use pip and pyenv, and this combination buys us these three things, uh, basically managing a lot of the dependencies, multiple Python versions, and you can spin up and uh, switch between different virtual environments really easily with these tools. And on the same vein, um, we use Packrat on the R um, side. It's a really nice open source uh, package in, in um, R. And sort of the, reiterating the same points, you, know, you can kind of separate your system environment with your repository environment. Uh, you can easily sync and upgrade and downgrade and sort of the cognitive load of, oh my gosh, like what version did you use? Oh, I use this version. That, for the most part, um, kind of goes away. Okay, so I figured since this is not our talk, I can like dig a little bit deeper into, into Packrat and how we use it. Um, so the thing to understand about it um, are, or the components of Packrat, I've highlighted in blue. So say this is your data science repo. You have some project folders in there. Um, but I'd just like to highlight a few things. So uh, packrat.lock, uh, it's basically an index of all the, the packages you have. You don't want to edit this file. Um, I think in our studio, you can interact with it really nicely. But um, this is the thing that you commit to your Git repository. Whenever something changes, say a teammate updates something, you push this file up, um, you pull it down uh, as a teammate, and you restore um, the state of your uh, package dependencies in your repository using the interface that I'll, I'll get into a little bit later. The ops file is also an important thing. This you can also interact with in RStudio. Um, three things I've bolded out are things you might want to consider if you um, want to use uh, Packrat in your workflow. The first uh, thing is the auto snapshot feature. So snapshot is a command you do to kind of save the state of your package dependencies in your repository. Um, and the next two things are, we learned this the hard way. You don't want to commit uh, the library and source files in your repository because those can be you know, many hundreds of megabytes. And yeah, it's just not a good idea in general. All right, so these are some of like the key workflow kind of commands. So you initialize Packrat. You can turn it on and off in an R session, which is really nice. Um, you take a snapshot, and you can restore it. And you can also do a little bit of spring cleaning. So if you have some re library or require calls in your R scripts and you're not actually using anything in it, um, it'll catch that, and you can clean up house, which is nice. Um, just a little like, pictorial interlude here. So I thought this was pretty. But uh, I, th I just take a few minutes to remind everyone of something very obvious about software development. Software development is really hard. And it's almost always not rainbows and butterflies. Um, and you know, when you use tools, the tools are very helpful. But oftentimes, you, know, you hit up against some snags. So just a little kind of toy example here of something we experienced uh, in our use of Packrat Ooh. Uh, is uh, that sometimes if there's a new package in, on CRAN or something, uh, Packrat, the Packrat restore command has a little bit of trouble finding that URL, the right URL. I think this is an issue um, that's in GitHub or wherever issues are logged. Um, but you know, there are straightforward ways of getting around this. Uh, you can use R's installation procedure, or you can manually download the source file into the packrat slash source, and packrat will be happy. It knows how to install it. OK, cool. So we have some tools to maintain our code base. We can sync package dependencies. Um, now, because the talk is R Python hybrid uh, pipeline, uh, I'd like to get into how we connect R and Python. Um, and it's actually really simple. Um, we don't do anything super fancy. Um, but just to remind you, this is our pipeline. 
Uh, again, you know, data I.O., all that stuff, manipulation, all that happens in Python. And whenever we need to uh, do some model build and evaluation stuff, we call out to R. R does its thing, spits out um, the output and the, the results, and we're happy. So I wanted to give you a little bit of like a sort of a hello world example. Um, hopefully you can read that of how these two things might be connected. So we're calling from Python, right? So we're using the subprocess library. It's a core library in Python. And um, you have two things, two components. You have, say, you have this model builder script that's in R, and then you have this model pipeline script that's in Python. All right. So the first thing to notice in purple, I've sort of abstracted these two key components of reading the data into R and training the model. Um, so let's not worry about that too much, but this build model function sort of builds a model. That's a great way to name functions is you know what they do because of their name. All right, so then you go into your, um, you're calling the, the Python script that's going to call R. So you have to supply it with this, the path to your R, R executable, the path to your script, and then these in green, these three arguments that go into build model. And so that this is sort of you, you run it, and it, it works, and it's, it's nice. And why, why do we use subprocess? If I were to start from the bottom to, to top, um, we actually don't need a super tight integration between R and Python. Like, we don't need to load model objects into Python from R. Um, and that's because, first and second point, we've very clearly defined the roles of these two languages. And so the third point is we can just we can write a script that kind of acts as an interface between the two languages. And it keeps things like separate and nice. And um, there are probably other reasons why you might not want this system. Um, you might want to load R data frames or R model objects. So there are other options for that uh, that I won't get into. All right, cool, testing. <clears throat> so this gets into a little bit of the statistical rigor of, uh, of the need, our need as a data science team. And there's a whole deep literature about this, but just to remind everyone that one of the core motivations for testing is we want our pipeline to be tolerant to change. In other words, if I mess with something in this, this, this part of the pipeline, is something going to break in this other part? And I don't want that to pass silently. I want a big error message that comes up, and I'm like, oh, let's unbreak this. Um, so this really, this framework kind of just applies primarily to legacy code, but I think it has some important principles that are applicable. You know, if you use TDD or BDD or whatever DD uh, technique you use. Uh, but the main idea is you want to identify these change points. If I change a parameter here, where where is the change happening? Um, I want to then write tests um, against that, so I can assert the behavior of the pipeline. So given a certain set of assumptions, what's going to happen? Is it going to throw an error? Is it going to output? What does, what does the output look like? And from there, you can kind of safely make changes and safely refactor and know that you're breaking something when you're breaking something. All right, cool. And so finally, this reproducible pipeline point um, is a critical part of our workflow because, say, I have an experiment. I'm building that model that you saw earlier with a specific set of parameters and specific formula that I'm building the model with. Um, I run the pipeline. There might be like 10 arguments. And a month from now, I want to know, I, can, I want to reproduce those results. The, the kind of the headspace and the cognitive load to kind of go back and like look through some docs and whatever um, can be easily alleviated by using some, a tool like Make, which is an awesome tool. Uh, it's language agnostic. Um, in Unix and Linux type systems, and it enables this reproducible workflow. Uh, and it also has this other advantage of serving as a little lightweight documentation in your repo. So on the left, you can see this is the command that I would run to build my model. You can imagine that in a more complex pipeline, there would be a lot more arguments. You know, the, the constraints of those arguments might be more complex as well. As opposed to the left, I just have a make file. It says everything, and it supplies all the arguments I need. 
a teammate can run the same thing and can be guaranteed for the most part that they'll get the same results, assuming that you're using the entire, all the other you know, things and tools in our tool chain that I've talked about so far. And you can just run make build model, very little headspace. You want to reduce that. All right, so just to wrap up a little bit, um, these, are, these are like some of the big wins that we get by adopting these tools. We you know, hit all of our points, I think. Um, but just as a reminder, these are just tools. It's kind of how you use them. Um, and the costs, the main cost is the necessary time investment to you know, learn the tools. You know, Git is like super powerful, but there's like so many features to it. I always am learning Git. Like sometimes I like, I think I know it, and then there's something that doesn't ex you know behave the way I expect. I'm like, oh, I have to go through the docs again. Um, breaking old habits uh, based on you know your pre previous workflows from previous teams or you know whatever, and also creating fixes and trying to find solutions to the kind of snags you hit up against. Um, and so just to end, I just want to show everyone uh, return to this question, and I think with a lot of things in life, you know, the answer is it, it depends on you know your specific problem, your team, the resources that you have. Um, but you know, if if there's something that you want to take away from this talk, it's that a software development is hard, b tools help, and um, it's you want to be intentional and very thoughtful about. Uh, not only how you use the tools, but how you choose the tools themselves. And those things, aside from like all the other important work of like actually building a pipeline, you want to iterate on those processes as well. And with that, um, I'll open up to questions. <laughs>